the Committee will come to order. The Oversight Committee exists to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. Our job is to work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. Without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare recesses of the Committee at any time. Today's witness, Mr. B. Todd Jones, took over as the head of the ATF as the first or as acting director and later as the first director in the wake of Operation Fast and Furious and the scandal that surrounded it. His mission was to change the culture at ATF and to move the agency in the right direction. This was no small task. Two and a half years into his tenure, it is safe to say the ATF still has a long way to go. Just over a year ago in Milwaukee, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel reported on Operation Fearless, an undercover storefront operation conducted by the Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms in Milwaukee, Wisconsin during the Director's tenure. Everything about Operation Fearless was wrong. ATF agents allowed convicted felons to leave the store armed and dangerous. Three weapons, including a machine gun, and I repeat, not a semi-automatic weapon often called a machine gun, a machine gun, were stolen from an ATF vehicle. The storefront was, burglari a, the storefront was burglarized and $39,000 worth of merchandise were stolen, all because the ATF neglected to install an alarm system. ATF exploited a mentally handicapped person with an IQ in the mid-50s to assist in the storefront operation, and then arrested this poor, limited-capacity individual for his involvement. When we learned about this, Chairman Goodlatte, Chairman Sensenbrenner, ranking member, Senate Ranking Member Grassley, and I immediately wrote the ATF requesting more information. Only after receiving our letter did the Director that day order an internal review, even though ATF management was aware of all the operations problems. In April 2013, ATF briefed committee staff on this operation. ATF assured us that the botched operation was, and I quote, an isolated incident. In December 2013, however, we learned that ATF mismanaged similar undercover operations across the country, stretching from Portland, Oregon, to Albuquerque, to Wichita, to Atlanta, to Pensacola, Florida. These other storefront operations followed an incredibly reckless pattern. Agents allowed felons to leave the store with weapons. Agents exploited mentally handicapped people, and agents failed to take precautions to protect the stores from theft. ATF's dangerous tactics may actually be increasing crime in your neighborhood. When ATF undertook these operations, these operations do not inspire public confidence. Rather, they make America wonder if ATF is a reliable partner to keep the streets safe. The Milwaukee operation, Fearless, was part of the ATF's Monitored Case Program. The Monitored Case Program was created after Operation Fast and Furious to ensure careful oversight of field operations from ATF headquarters. Unfortunately, it is clear that the in the case of Operation Fearless, the Monitoring Case Program failed and failed miserably. Today's hearing will explore whether other cases are slipping through the cracks at ATF, even though monitored case programs exist to prevent just that. Effective leadership requires accountability. Accountability ensures 
that mistakes are not repeated. Three years after the death of Border Patrol agent Brian Terry, ATF has yet to fire anybody for their roles in Operation Fast and Furious, and I personally find that inexcusable. Today we, have, we will learn whether ATF has held any employ, employees accountable for dangerous, mismanaged Operation Fearless. We have been down this path before. ATF has promised to change its culture, uh, implement new policies and procedures, and hold agents accountable for their actions. But what good are these new policies and procedures if they, too, fail? What good are promises of accountability if the accountability never occurs? What message does it send to the hardworking ATF agents who get it right? You could be reckless and jeopardize public safety in furtherance of your investigation, but you will not be disciplined or certainly not fired. The Director now faces a difficult task of moving the agency forward from its most recent scandal and hopefully, finally, restoring the integrity to the ATF. I now recognize the Ranking Member for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I would like to uh, welcome our witness today, the Honorable B. Todd Jones, who was confirmed and sworn in last summer as the Director of the Bureau of Alcohol tobacco, firearms, and explosives. For seven years since 2006, the ATF did not have a Senate-confirmed director. So I uh, welcome Director Jones's confirmation, and I know he has been extremely busy addressing many of the Bureau's problems and challenges that he inherited. ATF plays a critical role in enforcing our Nation's firearms laws and combating illegal firearms trafficking, and other crimes as agents, investigators, and support staff work to protect the American people from gun violence that has ravaged communities across the country, and as a matter of fact, has ravaged the very community that I, lived, that I have lived in for the last 32 years. ATF personnel play the key roles in responding to the Navy Yard shootings, the Boston Marathon bombings, the Sandy Hook tragedy, and the Aurora movie theater attack. In the words of Chairman Issa, I want to thank all of those ATF agents publicly right now who get it right. Given the inherent dangers associated with conducting operations that target violent criminal organizations, the ATF must take on a certain degree of risk. Our hearing today should focus on ensuring that the Bureau properly manages this risk while protecting the safety of its personnel and especially the surrounding community. Today we will hear about one type of operation, the undercover storefront. The ATF officials explain that the Bureau has used this investigative technique successfully over many years by working deep inside communities that are being terrorized by violent gangs and drug cartels, ATF agents contend that they have been able to make a significant difference to, for the residents of these various neighborhoods. And I am hoping that during his testimony this morning, uh, the Director will explain to us exactly what is so special about these types of programs and why are they required to get to certain types of problems. Over the last year, however, there have been numerous allegations involving storefront operations in several cities. In January 2013, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel reported that an undercover storefront operation in Milwaukee purchased weapons at above market prices, including weapons that were recently purchased at retail outlets. <clears throat> it also reported that three ATF issued firearms were stolen from the trunk of an agent's vehicle, including an automatic weapon that was never recovered. I also reported that some defendants were incorrectly identified and charged, and that the operation netted primarily low-level individuals on firearms and drug charges. Last December, the General Sentinel highlighted additional allegations in five cities, Albuquerque, Atlanta, Pensacola, Portland, 
and Wichita. According to these reports, some of these operations allegedly targeted individuals with mental disabilities. One operation was located near a school, and some others allowed felons to leave the premises with firearms they brought into the store. I understand that as soon as these uh, press reports came out, the then Acting Director Jones ordered the Bureau's Office of Professional Responsibility and Security Operations to fully investigate these allegations. Last March, this office issued a detailed report and found many deficiencies with these operations. According to the report, and I quote, these deficiencies caused a loss of property, created risks to the public and officer safety, and led to the improper arrest of four individuals, end of quote. The report found that the, and I quote, absence of comprehensive written guidelines and best practices for the operation of an undercover storefront was a contributing factor in many of the deficiencies in Operation Fearless, end of quote. It also found that the primary cause for deficiencies not being identified and corrected was the failure of the case agent and the first-line supervisors to report those problems. I am hopeful that Director Todd Jones will, Director Jones will address the issue of uh, accountability and the, the issue of people reporting up. We found in Fast and Furious there were some issues with that. And so the question becomes, has that been corrected? In response to these findings, Director Jones and ATF prepared a comprehensive manual incorporating lessons learned from the Milwaukee operation and best practices from many other successful storefronts. The Bureau also will require personal briefings between agents and ATF headquarters as well as on-site inspections of the storefronts. As I close, I hope that the committee will hear more today about ATF's responses to these serious allegations, the reforms ATF has implemented, and additional measures ATF can take to enhance safety in high-risk operations. ATF certainly has had its share of problems over the years. Our focus today should be on ensuring that the agency continues its path towards reform. I understand that the Department of Justice Inspector General is also investigating the Milwaukee operation, and I hope we can obtain the results of that review soon as well. Finally, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to place into the record a letter sent to the committee yesterday from the Federal Law Enforcement Officers Association. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Chairman. Yield back. Uh, gentleman yields back. Members may have seven days in which to submit opening statements for the record. I now ask unanimous consent that the letter sent yesterday to ATF by Brian Terry's family be placed in the record. Without objection, so ordered. And I would ask that, the, uh, uh, that Mr. Jones also be provided with one if he doesn't already have it. For what purposes does the gentleman uh, seem to be consent? Mr. Chairman, just a unanimous consent. Personal privilege. Does one one second, seconds. I want to introduce a very, very special guest, somebody you have read about in the history books who is my guest today. The gentleman sitting back here is uh, Joe Kittinger, who held the uh, record, a man uh, jumping in from space. He's had almost every honor you can imagine and recognized uh, nationally and internationally, part of the National Aviation Hall of Fame here. Uh, Joe would, and his wife, uh, Sherry, uh, Joe, raise your hand so everybody can see you, and thank you for being with us today. I thank the gentleman. Uh, we now welcome our witness. The Honorable B. Todd Jones is the director, the first full director of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and Explosives. Pursuant to the committee rules, I ask that the witness please rise and take the oath. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Please be seated. seated. Let the record reflect that the witness answered in the affirmative. Mr. Jones, you are a returning uh, witness, so you know the routine. Uh, we won't shut off the clock, but hopefully uh, you will use close to the five minutes. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you. Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear today. 
I'm pleased to be here to discuss the progress ATF ma has made in implementing reform and to discuss our undercover storefront operations. As you all know, ATF's principal mission is to protect our communities from violent criminals who engage in acts of arson, criminally misuse explosives, and illegally possess and use firearms. We accomplish this mission through both the enforcement of the criminal law and the regulation of the firearms and explosives industry. When violent crime shakes our nation, ATF is there to work side by side with our law enforcement partners, providing our specialized skills, tools, and experience. As was mentioned, in the past two years alone, ATF has provided crucial support to our federal and local partners in the investigation of the Boston Marathon bombing and the horrific mass shootings in Aurora, Colorado, Newtown, Connecticut, and the Washington Navy Yard. Equally important, though, we work with these partners to address the less visible but no less devastating daily violence that plague our cities and towns large and small. Across the country, ATF pursues the most violent criminals, particularly those who engage in organized gang violence or illegally supply those gangs with firearms. And a few of these successes are highlighted in the more fulsome written statement that we have submitted. Our agents put their lives on the line on a daily basis. As they investigate our nation's most violent criminals, they must make difficult and often instantaneous decisions every day, constantly balancing public safety, their own safety, and the integrity of the operation. Of all the activities undertaken by ATF agents in the field, none is more risk-laden or potentially more valuable than undercover work. ATF agents working undercover have infiltrated and brought down notorious motorcycle and street gangs, thwarted murder-for-hire plots, and removed thousands of guns from the hands of criminals. The Committee has asked that I address one undercover tactic in particular. That is the use of storefront operations. A storefront operation is a valuable investigative technique in which the undercover law enforcement officers or agents operate a business that is calculated to identify and proactively intervene with criminals and criminal activity in high crime areas and hotspots. They are often conducted as joint operations with other Federal, State and local law enforcement agencies and prosecutors. ATF conducted 37 storefronts between 2009 and 2013. ATF had one storefront active in 2013, and currently we have no active storefront operations. Storefronts are staff, equipment, and resource intensive and require significant planning and coordination. The success of a storefront is also dependent upon a strong partnership and ongoing collaboration with our local law enforcement partners. The storefronts to be discussed here today identified and built cases against criminals and would-be criminals in each and every location. As a result of our storefront operations in Albuquerque, Atlanta, Milwaukee, Pensacola, Portland, and Wichita, over 250 defendants have been convicted and over 1,300 firearms recovered. These defendants have over 350 previous felony convictions. These convictions and the firearms recoveries undoubtedly made the communities and the people who live there safer. I acknowledge, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, that there were deficiencies in our execution and management of some past activities in certain storefronts, but I want to assure you that public safety is the utmost important to me and our current team at ATF. We recognize that storefronts and other undercover operations require stringent oversight in all facets of planning and execution. We have put in place several policy and operational changes, <laughs> creating a tighter process for the authorization, management, and oversight and review of undercover operations, including storefronts. As an organization, we are committed to learning from the past and using some of those hard-learned lessons to improve, adapt, and ensure that we do not repeat the mistakes of our predecessors. In addition to our own efforts, ATF has and will continue to cooperate with all Inspector General reviews and investigations. Some of the specific reforms we have instituted pursuant to our own initiatives are outlined in our written submission. But the important point is putting our work, putting policy into practice. That is what we have been working very hard on the last several years. It is one thing to put policies on paper. It is another to make them real and put them into practice. All ATF employees, including me, are accountable for their actions and must act at all times with professionalism, integrity, and commitment to the agency's vital public safety mission. While I firmly believe we are on the right path, I am also realistic, Mr. Chairman, and recognize that meaningful change takes time. 
Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I want to conclude by saying that ATF is proud to be at the front line against violent crime, that we are recognized across the country for our expertise and take great pride in our successes that reduce gun violence and remove violent offenders from the streets. I am humbled by the exceptional work done every day by ATF special agents, industry investigators, and the support staff combating violent crime. In the face of sustained criticism over the last several years, the dedicated men and women of ATF have continued day in and day out to work tirelessly to enhance the safety for all Americans. They and their families have my deepest gratitude for their sacrifices that this often thankless work requires, and I am honored to be here today to represent ATF. Thank you for your interest, and I am sure you have questions which I will do my best to address. Thank you, Director Jones. And I, too, want to uh, reiterate the importance of the work that the men and women of the ATF do and, and how much we appreciate the many who take a risk to do the right thing in the right way. Let me go through a couple of questions. Uh, no surprise, the first one is a little related to Fast and Furious. Uh, Everybody at the Department of Justice, from yourself to the Attorney General, is living under the specter of Fast and Furious and how it discredited uh, the men and women who do these jobs otherwise right. Uh, just to make the record clear, was anyone fired as a result of Fast and Furious? Mr. Chairman, uh, I can say publicly in this forum that everyone involved at ATF and the chain of command has either been uh, disciplined or is no longer with the agency. Okay. But the answer of fired is no. Is that correct? It's a yes or no. It really is, Todd. As a result of the Inspector General's report, the answer is no. Okay. So no one was fired. Some chose to retire. But let's go to a particular individual of interest, William Newell. The IG recommend that he be removed, but in a settlement, we have learned that he was demoted from SES to GS-13. Did you approve that settlement? Mr. Chairman, um, we have provided uh, in great detail to the committee in um, a confidential document uh, the processes that we followed internally following the release of the IG's report. Uh, it outlines with some particularity all of the individuals that were identified in that report and the actions taken. Uh, I, I'm, I am not uh, at liberty in this public forum to get into detail. But Director, Director you are here pursuant to a subpoena specifically because Congress uh, does not afford you that choice on the Privacy Act by the statute itself. But more importantly, we know, that we know what occurred. My question simply was one that you can answer. It has nothing to do with privacy. Did you make that decision? The process at ATF involves uh, a professional responsibility board. Now, Director, I, I understand. I am only asking, did you influence or, in, or have an input into that call of his not being fired, his continuing to draw a paycheck and eventually retire at his high pay as an SCS? I did not. You did not. Did your number two have that input? The process involves uh, the bureau deciding official and the ultimate decision maker uh, is a deputy director with appeal to me should the employee not be satisfied when it comes to The employee to was satisfied and the number two made the call. Is that fair to say for the public record? That is fair to say. Okay. Uh, similarly, uh, the Professional Review Board proposed that Hope McAllister receive a 14-day suspension, which I consider pretty minor. This was reduced to a letter of reprimand. Would that also have gone through your deputy? Again, Mr. Chair, the, the process is pretty well delineated in terms of uh, the rights of the employees to grieve and the ultimate decision being made with my involvement with the senior executive service being a little different than anyone who is not a member of the SCS ranks. Okay. The Professional Review Board uh, proposed that David Voigt be demoted to a non-supervisorial special agent position. In settlement, he was demoted. Again, that would have been the same process you are alluding to. There is a process and it was followed. Okay, so McAllister, Vogt, and, uh, uh, and Newell. 
None of them were fired. All of them received uh, certainly less than what the American people would expect. Let me move on. Uh, these five separate uh, undercover storefront operations, with uh, obviously the uh, Milwaukee one being the best known. Uh, at this point, I am going to ask unanimous consent that the letter dated December 12, 2013, from an organization, nonprofit called ARC, for, uh, for people with intellectual and development disabilities addressed to the Attorney General be placed in the record along with excerpts from their website, without objection, so ordered. I am going to read to you something, uh, Director Jones, from that letter, in which to uh, Attorney General Holder, they say, besides that it is appalling and unfortunate in other terms, they say, speaking of the intellectually disabled people with low IQs, they typically have limited, if any, understanding about their involvement in a crime or consequences of being involved in a crime, with few options for or opportunities to build safe relationships, their strong need to be accepted by peers in their own communities can create a unique vulnerability that people without IDD do not experience. Have you become familiar with the effects that agents can have by buddying up to people with IQs in their 50s as a result of these operations? Well, I think it is important to point out that we do not target the developmentally disabled. When we run an undercover operation, we have very limited control over who comes in the door. I can tell you that my review of the circumstances, and I have met with ARC and talked to them about the concerns with enhanced training. But uh, all of these issues that have been identified in the media with respect to developmentally, developmentally disabled individuals being targeted uh, are the result of defense pleadings during a process. I am a former prosecutor, and oftentimes in investigations, the criminal investigators have no idea what the individual's intellectual capacity is. Yeah, but your agents worked with people, including at least one individual, that had to be tutored through to understand what a machine gun was so that they could send him out to go buy one so they could then arrest him. Now, Director, we have had a good relationship. You have got a big job. But I am going to ask you one closing question. Are you actually telling us that it is just an accident that your people managed to find people with extremely low IQs. These are people who are barely functional, who clearly demonstrate their special needs and limitations, very, very limited people. In, in the 80s and 70s, you might say, well, he's just not the brightest bulb. In the 50s and 60s, these are people severely handicapped, who just want to buddy up, who really exhibit a type of behavior that most people in America are, are somewhat familiar with, even if it doesn't enter their lives. You are saying that your agents don't look for these people that are so vulnerable that they can just buddy up and, uh, and get them to do these things? Are you saying that under oath here today? No, I am not saying that. It's so not, your agents do target people with low IQs because they are susceptible, exactly as this letter says, to the kind of influence and what is most appalling to us is after they use these people, often in dangerous positions, they then in many cases arrested the same people that they had put in and talked through doing these crimes. Is that correct? No, that is not correct, Mr. Chair. Well, that is what Mar Milwaukee Senate says, and it is what the evidence seems to show. Uh, I am going to let all of us continue on, and, and hopefully I will come back to you. Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Just picking up where the Chairman left off. Um, we, we had admitted into evidence, um, to the record a little earlier, this letter from the Federal Law Enforcement Officers Association, um, Jay Adler, the National President. When I was reading this this morning, I, I, he, there's a paragraph that kind of struck me, because I, too, am very sensitive to what uh, the Chairman just asked about people with low IQs and having my own experience in my own family. So I'm, it's very sensitive for me. Um, but it's this is what Mr. Uh, Adler said, and I, and I was just wondering whether you agree with this. In this letter, he said, it has been alleged that ATF targeted and exploited the mentally in incapacitated to facilitate storefront connections to prospective criminals. 
That is beyond absurd. And no one in the field administers impromptu Jeopardy style quizzes to assess the IQ of prospective criminal element. Prisons are occupied by criminals with IQs ranging from moron to genius. And anyone experienced in law enforcement will tell you that the former is the most difficult to use as a cooperator. Uh, furthermore, criminal element uh, don't provide their Myers-Briggs assessments to law enforcement, and agents are left with making a variety of critical assessments of those they are dealing with in real time, including threat levels and safety issues. Nonetheless, neither ATF nor any Federal law enforcement component is in the practice of exploiting mentally incapacitated individuals. That, that, I didn't say that. Mr. Adler, the National President, said that. What, do you agree with that, Mr. No, Jones, or do you have any issue with what he said there? Well, well thank you for the opportunity to further uh, explain uh, some of the things that the Chair was talking about. We do not target developmentally disabled or mentally challenged individuals. We target criminal behavior. And when you are running an undercover storefront operation, with all of the uh, bells and whistles to make sure that you can maintain the integrity of the operation, you have all kinds of individuals walking into the door. You have no idea. I think it's interesting to note that uh, the media reports about this targeting uh, of individuals really is based primarily on defense motions that were filed and the calling of the public record. And there's no awareness by the special agents at that time. All of these individuals uh, were brought to trial, and then all of them raised claims in the context of sentencing advocacy about their intellectual capacity. That's not unusual. I've been a defense lawyer, too. Uh, but that's after the fact, after someone's pled guilty. None of them have claimed that they were incompetent to stand trial. That's not to excuse the sensitivity involved and the enhanced training that may be involved, not only with the developmentally disabled, but people with mental illness. There was an article today in the New York Times that talked about the challenges law enforcement, state, federal, and local and particularly with ATF doing the violent crime kind of operations where we're having interactions with people on the street much like state and local law enforcement uh, officials. And it is a huge challenge for individuals who are in a law enforcement capacity to make determinations about uh, someone's mental illness or their mental capacity. Director Jones, I'd like to ask you about the specific actions you took when you became aware of these allegations. When the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel published his first story in January uh, 2013, you directed ATF Office of uh, Professional Responsibility and Security Operations to conduct an investigation. Is that right? That is correct. I gave him 30 days. Now, did, did you, had you known about it before then? I had two indicators before that. Uh, one was uh, some indication that a storefront in the St. Paul Field Division had been burglarized. Uh, this storefront closed down in September and it had been burglarized. So I do have recollection about seeing the storefront being burglarized. I also had an indicator that uh, in the reports about the stolen weapons. But that was, that was the extent of uh, uh, the red flags that were going off. I think the, the third thing was when we did see that there were landlord-tenant issues in part flagged in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel about how we left the storefront, um, that is when we dispatched internal affairs to go out and do a deep dive and look at uh, what was going on in Milwaukee. Can you explain to us, and I think the Chairman would be interested in hearing this too, and I said it in my opening statement, can you explain to us what is so unique about the storefront and why, what problem does it get to that you had to bring that kind of operation into, uh, into play? Well, it's an, it's an undercover technique that really is designed to do several things. One is to gather intelligence uh, in, uh, in, in the area that you locate the store, gather intelligence about crime gun trafficking, gather intelligence about uh, criminal activity. Uh, it's also an opportunity to remove crime guns from the street. Uh, and that is in an ideal world. But it is uh, primarily uh, an information intelligence gathering technique, and it is uh, an opportunity to remove crime guns from the street. In, in Baltimore, where we have had uh, a pretty high crime rate, uh, and had cooperation from ATF and many other agencies, um, one of the things that I have always uh, 
thought about and concerned about. And I, I live where The Wire was filmed. I live there. Um, is how do you get to, you talked about intelligence. If there is a drug operation going on and drug folks say, for example, I'm using this hypothetically, are fighting each other for territory, how do you get information to know, to, 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 to prevent a murder? In other words, one body, I mean, is it, would this kind of operation be helpful in that, that? Because it seems like there's some people look at murder rates of, of, of cities, but a lot of times um, the question is how would, they, how would the police even know? So would this kind of operation go to that too? This is just a, a tool in the toolbox. There are other things that we do, other undercover types of operations. There's uh, Title III um, telephone uh, intercepts. And then there's just good old-fashioned investigation um, where people take information, they pull the threads, they use confidential informants, um, and they build a case brick by brick. And that takes information. My last question. One of the things that concerns me, and, and the chairman talked about this a bit, you know, we've got an, a, an agency that has been under a microscope, has been highly criticized, um, and is also an agency that didn't have a director, f f a permanent director for years, and an agency that some would like to see just disappear. Um, and it just seems to me that one of the problems that I saw in Fast and Furious is that the information didn't, didn't filter up to the top. What have, what's new now? What have you done to address that so that when you come before us, you can be held accountable? And we were in situations before where the top people knew nothing about what was going, down, going on down below. And I was just curious as to where we are now with that and did anything, did we learn anything from that? And did we learn anything from these storefront situations when you, when you got pulled together your recommendations as to how you do business now? How is that different? Well, I think. If at all. Well, it, 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 a lot's changed. Uh, but as I mentioned in my opening remarks, change takes time. And one of the things that I believe uh, is really important to understand is the lift that's required to turn policy and procedure into practice. When I came on as acting director in uh, September of 2011, the monitored case program had been on paper in July of 2011. And it was a paper program. It was the fundamentals. Uh, and we took a lot of action with the pin right out of the blocks. But in addition to the pin, you need the people. You need to get the right people in the right spots. You need to construct a team, and you need to emphasize over and over again with a focus that this has got to be real. And this is all taking place in an environment over the last several years where we've had tremendous turnover in the organization and uh, a very challenging budget environment. And we're grateful um, that we do have an FY14 budget so that we can plan. But this is an organization, as you pointed out, that had not had continuous leadership. Now, it, between acting and being confirmed, I've got 30 months on the job. And I very much have the philosophy, uh, I own it, for good or bad. And when something's wrong, I'm going to take action to fix it. But those remedial steps don't always happen overnight. So we've been working very hard with our team to make sure we're learning from mistakes, that some of the systemic challenges that were pointed out in the OIG Fast and Furious report are fixed and they stick. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We now recognize the gentleman from Ohio. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Jones, are you familiar with the name Catherine Engelbrecht? I think that is an individual who, uh, yes. Okay. Uh, and you're familiar with the fact that she testified in front of this committee eight weeks ago, and her testimony under oath was that in 16 years of operating her business, the only interaction she had had with the federal government was filing her annual tax return. She files for tax-exempt status for two organizations she was involved in creating, True the Vote and King Street, uh, King Street Patriots, and then gets all kind of interaction with the federal government. OSHA visits her place of business. Never happened in her first 16 years, but then OSHA visits her place of business twice. 
Uh, the IRS audits both their personal and business records for two years. Um, the um, FBI pays her six visits, two in person, four on the phone, and another organization, your organization, pays her two visits as well. Um, I sent you a letter six weeks ago asking for documents relating to the visits ATF made to Ms. Engelbrecht's place of business, and you have yet to respond to us. Is there a reason why you can't get us those documents? Well, I can check into what the delay is in the response. I can tell you, Congressman, that uh, it's been six weeks, Mr. Jones, and it's, it's, it seemed to me to be a pretty simple search. Put the name Engelbrecht into your computers, come up with the documents, get them to Chairman Issa and myself. My understanding, Ms. Engelbrecht's interactions with us, and I cannot speak for any of the other uh, Federal agencies involved, uh, a, a license request and a qualification inspection and then a follow-up. So she had that license for 12 years. Why did you suddenly decide to go visit her? She pre previous 12 years never had any interaction with you. You visit her in February 2012 and April 2013. Why did you visit her on those dates? Why did you visit her twice in 13 months when for the first 12 years you never paid her any visit? Congressman, I will get back to you on the letter. Let me read what the Inspector General's report says about how ATF goes out and, and, and looks at Federal firearms licensees compliance inspections. It says you look for high risk indicators. Is that true? That is one of the factors when. High risk indicator says this such as a high number of guns used in crimes being traced back to the licensee, numerous multiple sales by a Federal firearms licensee to a single individual, theft or losses of firearms, location in a high crime area, tips from State or local law enforcement agents. Do you know if you had any of those circumstances, any of those indicators, were any of those present before you went to visit Ms. Engelbrecht? I, I don't have the information sufficient in front of me to answer I can that. tell you none of them were. And yet you show up 12 years, no one, never heard from ATF in 12 years, and then suddenly she applies for tax exempt status, and you're knocking on her door twice in 13 months. Congressman, I wish I had better answers as to what other agencies. I do too, agencies. Mr. Jones. This is a pretty important issue. It's been front and center in the news for over a year now. I do too. Can you imagine what this lady felt like? She gets the full weight of the federal government coming down on her, her family, and her business, and all she's trying to do is get a tax exempt status that had been routine for 50 years, and suddenly now the Federal Government is saying, no, 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 you are not going to get that tax exempt status, and we are going to send four Federal agencies out to harass you, including yours. Well, Congress, it is unfortunate that you and uh, Ms. Engelbrecht think it is harassment. From our perspective, it is part of our regulatory function, both to do qualifications. You think it is unusual that four Federal agencies visit her in that short time frame? I can't speak for other agencies other than ATF. Let me ask you this. Did anyone at the White House encourage ATF to pay uh, Ms. Engelbrecht a visit and go inspect? No. Did any other Federal agency talk to you or anyone at ATF and encourage you to inspect and visit Ms. Engelbrecht? No. Did any member of Congress contact you or anyone at ATF and encourage you to go out and visit and inspect uh, Ms. Engelbrecht's Federal firearms license? Not to my knowledge. No, no, no knowledge of anyone contacting you at all. Did Not you talk? Much. Have you talked to any uh, anyone, any other federal agency about what you learned or discussed or discovered when you visited Ms. Engelbrecht's place of business? Not to my knowledge. What did you discover when you visited there in February of 2012 and April of 2013? It's a qualification inspection. I have uh, no idea based on what I have. Was there any citations? Any problems? Any fines? Any anything that you discovered? I don't know. Our understanding is there is not. We have talked to Ms. Engelbrecht. In fact, we had her sit right in that same chair and, and, and answer questions from this committee. We've, we've, let me ask you one other question. Did, did Tom Perez have any input into your, in, uh, your uh, agency's determination to go and inspect and investigate uh, Ms. Uh, Engelbrecht's place of business? No. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, would the gentleman yield? I'd be happy to yield. Uh, just a statement. Uh, I also signed on to that letter and am disappointed we didn't receive uh, further answers before this hearing. I will say that in light of the deliberate and verified targeting of conservative groups by Lois Lerner and the IRS, we cannot take coincidence things which occur which appear to be linked to somebody's application as a conservative for an IRS application. There were leaks out of the IRS of names of contributors, including a constituent of, of the ranking member, uh, that were damaging and appeared to be deliberate. So I hope you will understand that when we see a pattern by an agency and then we see coincidences, it is our committee's requirement 
to fully explore what appear to be unusual anomalies. We are not accusing you of anything, but we do need the specifics, uh, both classified and unclassified, as necessary so that we can understand how such an anomaly occurred. Mr. Chairman, real brief, I could. Mr. Jones, can you give us a, uh, a date when you can get that, those documents to the Chairman and myself and the entire committee? We will work with staff and your staff to uh, figure out the specifics. Sooner or later? What, what, was it going to be as soon as next we week? As soon as we can. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I only want your commitment that you will provide them. We have been cooperative with both your staff and uh, committee members in providing information as quickly as we can. I hope you understand that there is a process. I do know that we have got to get better answering the mail. We have worked very hard and have changed some of our processes to get better answering the mail because we know you need information and we have it. But we also have a certain process and level of sensitivities to. Mr. Chairman, I mean, this, uh, again, this is simple. This is one individual, Catherine Engelbrecht. The documents are related to why you went after 12 years of never showing up at her place, why you decided to go twice in 13 months. Any document that has Engelbrecht mentioned in it, we want that information. That's a pretty simple search. I think you could have had it to us in a week, a day maybe. But here we are six weeks later, and you are telling us uh, we will try to do it as soon as we possibly can. We've heard that from, we heard that last week from John Koskin at the IRS. Uh, I, I he told the, us two years. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, welcome, Director Jones. We are so glad you are in place, confirmed after seven years uh, of acting directors at the ATF, finally to have a, a confirmed director. Thank you. Uh, and I think, uh, I think it's quite notable that in your brief tenure you have already made a huge change. As I understand it, 23 uh, field special agents in charge out of 25 are new under your leadership, 38 new headquarters senior executives new under your leadership, uh, to say nothing of looking at the storefront operation and making reforms there. By the way, you can look up Ms. Engelbrecht. I remember that hearing, too. She seemed to think uh, that uh, it was uh, outrageous uh, and the government was uh, out to get her uh, because she wasn't notified about uh, an OSHA inspection at her manufacturing plant. Of course, the statute is clear that would actually be a violation of law if OSHA had given advance notice, by the way, we are coming. She was found to have nine serious violations. She wasn't inspected for a period of time. Well, we only have 2,200 OSHA inspectors for 8 million workplaces. So it's not unusual that there could be a gap of as much as 20 years before a, uh, a firm actually might be inspected. Uh, and she settled, by the way. The original fine was $24,850. She settled for $14,910. So other than that, the government is out to get her. Um, Director Jones. <coughs> Did you volunteer to come and testify before this committee? I, I, I am here with the invite from the chair. Yeah. Were you subpoenaed to come here? I, I believe there was a subpoena issued, but I was coming before the subpoena was issued. Okay. Um, so you are not here as an unwilling witness? No. I look forward to answering right. the questions. Right. Um, now, the chairman has alleged ATF has not been cooperative with the committee's investigation. So let me go through that. Um, on April 15th, ATF provided our committee staff with a briefing by an assistant director with operational knowledge of the Milwaukee operation. Is that correct? After uh, the Internal Affairs did their report with a 30-day turnaround, I believe they finished in March, we had a uh, briefing uh, because of some of the confidentiality issues. On April 15th. Involved, uh, April 15th right. of last so, year. So you were certainly cooperative with that? Yes, sir. Uh, at the briefing, your staff provided an overview of the detailed report that you ordered from the Office of Professional Responsibility and Security Operations. Is that right? Yes, sir. On April 30th, the Department of Justice provided additional information in response to the committee's request, answering questions about the operation and your knowledge of it. Is that right? That is my understanding. Hmm. The Department provided documents in response to the committee's request, including ATS policies for the storage of firearms and vehicles and for conducting storefront operations. Is that correct? Yes. On May 31, the Department provided additional information, including steps ATF had taken to improve its planning and oversight over undercover storefront operations. Is that correct? Yes, sir. 
but you did not provide the report from the Office of Professional Responsibility report at that time. Is that correct? I believe that that is correct, although it has been provided. Uh, don't in jump ahead of me. At that time, you did not provide it. That is correct. And the reason you didn't provide it was? We were fixing things. And you were in the middle of a criminal investigation, potentially. Yes, we were. And you didn't want to compromise that criminal investigation. That would be a bad thing. In, in the outlandish risk that somebody in this committee might leak it or use it. Uh, once we produce information that, that comp could compromise a criminal investigation. There is always sensitivity when we have parallel investigations and requests outstanding from Congress, from the Inspector General, and there are active criminal investigations. That report has now been provided to the committee. Is that correct? With some redaction, yes. yes sir. On March 19, the Chairman issued the subpoena. In his letter to you, he accused you of, and I quote, a complete lack of cooperation with the committee's investigation. He stated, and I quote, not once have you or your staff responded to any of these letters or produced even a single document. Is that an accurate statement of your relationship with this committee? I would hope that our relationship is appropriate and professional and that the information that we provide is done in a timely manner. But the fact is, Director Jones, you and your staff have made yourself available to this committee and you have produced documents including the one we were just talking about. Is that not correct? Yes, sir. So it is not accurate to say you have not produced a single document or that you have been completely uncooperative with this investigation, or is it? That is not accurate, sir. I thank you, and I thank you for your service, Director Jones, and we wish you all success. Thank you. I yield back. Mr. Connolly, would you like to take the witness stand? You seem to be very, not only good at giving testimony, but you are very good at getting Mr. Jones to give yes or no answers. Mr. Chairman, I have learned from the best. I have never, never been able to get Mr. Jones to answer something yes or no, but you are a master, and I congratulate you. I thank the Chair. Thank you. We now go to the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Chaffetz. Uh, thank the Chairman and, and uh, Director. Thank you for being here. Uh, congratulations on the, being appointed and uh, confirmed. We need you in this position. Wish you nothing but the best. Thank you. And we want to thank the men and women who serve on the front lines, very difficult situations, dealing with some nefarious characters, and God bless them for, for the work that they do. Um, I would like to ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a, a Office of Professional Responsibility and Security, Oper Security Operations report on Operation Fearless, dated March 21, 2013, simply the executive summary in pages 14 and 15. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Um, Director, is it safe to say that uh, the report, um, or that the analysis, the takeaway uh, from Fast and Furious, that it was fatally flawed, disastrous? How would you characterize uh, what happened at Fast and Furious? In just a word or two. Fast and Furious. Yeah. That is why I am here. It was a lack of oversight and it was um, a leadership failure. It, tell me then, as you look at what happened on this uh, Operation Fearless, how would you char characterize it? It was on a smaller scale because there is no comparison between Fast and Furious and what happened in Fearless. And I am not excusing the things that are in our internal affairs report and we have taken remedial action to fix those things like we have every time we have identified. But it was flawed as well, too, correct? It was flawed. There were mistakes that were made. It did result in prosecutions. It did result in guns coming off the street. It but it is certainly not the poster child of what we should be doing. It is no, certainly not. not the fix that we were hoping it was supposed to be. Nope. That operation had its flaws. Would the gentleman no, yield? It, it, didn't it also result in a machine gun going on the street that has never been found? Yes or no would be good, like Mr. Connolly. Context is important, too, Mr. Chair. I think it is important to note that the agent's vehicle was broken into between noon and 3 o'clock, and the safe was broken into. So it was unfortunate, and there were weapons lost, and there were some recovered, and there are some weapons that are still out there. So, Thank you. Um, do you recall when Bernard, otherwise known as B.J. Zaper, was appointed as the special agent in charge of the Phoenix office? I believe Mr. Zaper last year 
I believe, moved to the Phoenix office. He was the deputy assistant director of the Central, but he moved to be special agent in charge of the Phoenix Field Division. And, and what I find curious about that director is here we have the Phoenix office, probably the highest profile, on the heels of Fast and Furious, and yet this same person was in charge of an office that was executing on Operation Fearless. So here you have an internal report dated March 21st, 16 fundamental deficiencies. And you take the person who's in charge of one of those offices and you put them in charge of Phoenix. Well, Congressman, unlike Fast and Furious, there was um, very poor communications going on between the SAC and St. Paul and what was happening in Milwaukee. Whereas in Fast and but Furious... You took, but you took um, Mr. Milanowski who supervised the Milwaukee office, and you, you, you put him in Phoenix as well. I sure did. Why do you do that? If this thing is so flawed, you agreed that it was flawed. Which operation? And we're concerned, Which fear, Operation Fearless, you took the people who were overseeing the Milwaukee operation, the SAC, and then the person who's in charge of the Milwaukee office, and they get to go to Phoenix where you have the most, you got, you got to clean that place up. I don't understand how we take two people responsible for that and put them in charge of Phoenix. I don't see the accountability. I don't see anybody getting fired. I mean, we're taking mentally handicapped people and putting tattoos on their necks. We, we, we got missing weapons. We have uh, locations that are op opening in proximities to schools in violation of the law. We have stolen agent weapons. We have uh, an agent whose personal contact information is left in one of these offices. I mean, we're enticing people across state lines to engage in prostitution type things. I mean, the, the allegations on this just, I mean, I could go on for 10 minutes listing them out. Well, Where is the accountability? You've aggregated a lot of information uh, without really the opportunity to talk about some of those things in specifics. I can tell you that the individuals that were in the St. Paul Field Division and the movements that were made were made for very good reasons based on their records of performance. And that's not to excuse the mistakes made in Fearless. You don't have anybody more qualified than Mr. Zaper and Mr. Milanowski to oversee probably the most critical office on the heels of Fast and Furious after you have an internal report dated March 21st with 16 deficiencies listed out. You don't have anybody better than that to go down and run that office. There is solid leadership in the Phoenix Field Division and a lot, a lot of oversight down there. So you have full and total confidence in Mr. Zaper and Milanowski. I do. Thank you. Uh, Director, you, you said context was important. Would you let everyone understand what the gentleman asked you about or, or inferred about the tattoo on this severely disabled person? Well, if you are talking about the Operation Kraken in Portland, Oregon, I think it is important to note that the, um, the issues with respect to competency did not arise until the case morphed into litigation mode and defense counsel brought up the issue of uh, intellectual capacity. I think with respect to the tattoo, that was a mistake. I, and, and I've seen... Uh, but, but context is important. Just tell the story so everyone on the dais, because not everyone knows and certainly the public doesn't know, of what the agents did and what the judge did. Well, I, you know, there was an individual, as I understand it, in Operation Kraken that on their own volition got a tattoo that was the a logo for the storefront store and subsequently uh, was reimbursed by the storefront in the undercover mode. That is my understanding. The judge's I understanding was that the individual was talked into getting a tattoo, which was then or basically bought by your agents, and the judge ordered that you pay to have it removed. Isn't that correct? That is correct. Thank you. We now go to the gentlelady from Illinois, Ms. Duckworth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Director Jones, for being here. Um, I'm going to assume that when you are uh, come across uh, processes and procedures within the agency that are um, substandard or subpar, that you would be committed to uh, investigating them and perhaps coming up with better procedures. Is that correct? That's correct. So let's talk about our um, uh, 
what we've been talking about all day today, all morning this morning, with the um, involvement of persons with developmental and mental disabilities. Um, I am deeply, deeply concerned uh, that this has happened. And I understand uh, your statement that many of these persons are not being recruited by your agents, but in fact are people that they come across in the course of doing their jobs. Um, what training do your agents have with how to deal with persons with developmental disabilities and mental disabilities once they encounter them? Well, that was a topic of discussion with ARC, and that's something that we're looking at. Unfortunately, one of the things that have happened in a, in a, in a poor budget environment is training. Training is not what it should be. And I think not unique to ATF when you talk about developmentally disabled or people with mental illness, that there's not enough training of law enforcement officers to recognize and to deal with in situations of stress or in undercover operations about uh, how to deal and not deal with individuals. It's a, it's a very difficult challenge because oftentimes you can't tell uh, on, on the surface as to whether or not somebody's got uh, issues of that nature. Have you conducted an internal investigation into this issue? On the general issue, no. We have uh, talked internally about developing better training regimen for our folks, uh, particularly in the undercover setting. What about in this particular case of the uh, individuals who were uh, enticed into participating, the case of the, uh, the individual who had the tattoo, the case of the gentleman with his IQ in the mid-50s? Uh, if your IQ is in the mid-50s, uh, it is very clear that you are developmentally disabled. Have you done an, a formal investigation into those instances? Well, other than um, the, the Milwaukee operation, all of these other storefronts that have been identified in the media that are of concern um, predated my arrival, and so my level of knowledge about some of those instances uh, is not as deep, but I do know that the Inspector General has for review uh, some of those storefront operations, and so we will work with them once they peel back the layers of the onion about what the circumstances were. Because again, the media reports are um, not as fulsome with respect to the whole story, and a lot of the issues that have been raised about people's mental capacity only came to light during the trial process and sometimes in the sentencing process as part of mitigation for the sentencing. So this is not a circumstance where there are people who are obviously challenged walking into the storefront operation. These are after the fact knowledge that we learn of based primarily on the assertion of defense counsel. You don't think that your agents dealing with a man with an IQ in the 50s knew that he was developmentally disabled? You know, to be honest with you, Congresswoman, I, I, I don't know what they thought when someone came in. I've never met the individual. I don't know uh, other than the fact that uh, they were competent to stand trial, they pled guilty, they were sentenced for criminal conduct, and during the sentencing process, they, issues were raised about their, their intellectual capacity. Well, I, people I, with far higher IQs than 50 can also be intimidated in the, pro in the trial process to confess uh, just through the stress of the situation. My question to you is, so there is an IG investigation that is looking into this issue. Part is that of, correct? My understanding, part of what the Inspector General of the Department of Justice is looking into is this set of storefronts and looking at the details as to what happened when and why and how. Well, you know, leadership starts from, from the top. What commitments have you made personally to uh, uh, pursue this particular issue, whether it is to figure out what the situation was, to figure out what kind of training can be done, even on a limited budget basis? I'm sure ARC would probably be willing to cooperate with you to provide some of that training, or at least help you um, structure something. Uh, what commitment have you made as a director to show the entire agency that this is important to you and that this is something that is not acceptable conduct among your agents? Well, we have met with ARC. Uh, we are in discussions with them about developing an appropriate training package. We have put word out uh, uh, through our internal processes about situational awareness on the issue. But it really is on the go forward a matter of enhancing the level of knowledge and understanding to the agents who are out there as to what they need to be on the lookout for and how to deal with situations like that. So it's a training issue and we're working on that. I'm out of time, Mr. Chairman. 
gentlelady yields back. We now go to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Micah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Director Jones, a couple of questions um, about the operation in general. Um, now how long did this go on? Which operations? The, the storefronts. How long did you, uh, was the storefront operations going on? Well, it depends on the storefront, as I mentioned in my comment. Well, no, the whole program. I mean, uh, you have, well, how many did you have, 30-some? 30 37 uh, storefronts okay. between 2009 and 2013. Okay, so that would be about a four or five year period that this uh, operation went on. And um, now we've referred some of the worst egregious incidents took place in Milwaukee. I think there are like seven places that were cited, at least the report I have, Portland, Phoenix, Albuquerque, Wichita, Atlanta, and Pensacola, all of which had botched operations. Uh, that's sort of a given. Well, I, I wouldn't describe it as botched. I think that uh, the the one that I have the most knowledge of is the one Milwaukee. that was the Milwaukee. Yeah. Milwaukee, each of them had names. It, uh, we, we've gone from fast and furious. Now we've got, uh, I guess Milwaukee was given Operation Fearless. I think it should be renamed Operation Fearless and Brainless from what uh, we've heard here today. Uh, some of the things that went on um, are astounding. How, how much money did they spend in this program? Can you tell me during the four or five years? Well, I think uh, a million, half a million, 50, any idea? It depends on the. Can you provide the committee with the amount of money? That's I think, I, I believe that some documents that we have produced okay, uh, do, I just do like give some see, indication again, as to the cost. The, uh, there were 36 of these storefronts, seven of them uh, had. Uh, just horrible experiences. Um, uh, some of what I've read, uh, I guess in Wichita, uh, it doesn't sound like that had a, exactly a glorious uh, operation. Uh, crim criminal, known criminal came in with two AK-47s, and we only bought one. And uh, he was he was a known felon, and then was let out on uh, actually on the street with the other one that wasn't purchased. Are you aware of that case? I do have some knowledge about AK-47, bought one. And I'm told that we paid such a high price. That's, I want to find out how much we paid for these that actually where we had these operations, we had little crime waves of uh, people going out. They heard that you could uh, get these weapons uh, purchased at a higher than uh, black market rate. So there were uh, ATF is buying them at a high rate. And we had little crime sprees, uh, sprees. I've asked the staff to also look at these uh, different operations, but there was a spike in crime in those neighborhoods. Are you aware of that? I know that one of the indicators that we have in terms of monitoring and making sure a storefront is operated is, is it manufacturing crime? Okay. Uh, can you tell me again, uh, I, I, I'm interested in the results of this. Uh, how many weapons were seized in the whole program, do you know? I do know that... Uh, or, or purchased, I should say, not seized. How many? I think in the, in the six operations that are of particular interest to the committee, uh, including Fearless, that there were approximately about 1,300 weapons taken off the street. Okay, so I want to see the cost. Uh, uh, again, I'd like to see for the whole period of time, how many weapons actually, what, uh, what number of weapons? You said there uh, were some indictments. How many indictments and arrests? Well, we can get that specific information back to you. But I would think that would be the first thing you would tell the committee, is how many arrests, uh, uh, what the cost was of the operation, how many indictments? Do you know how many indictments we had? Well, in the six door fronts under discussion, 250 defendants were convicted, over 1,300 firearms were recovered, and the defendants had over 350 prior felonies. So these are oftentimes not first-time offenders. In Milwaukee, there were 16 federal defendants and 10 state defendants, 150 firearms. In Pensacola, which was February to October in 2011, 78 defendants convicted, 275 firearms recovered. Well, I'm, I'm told that the operations also had such a bad reputation that when FBI was uh, contacted about participating that they uh, shied away or denied uh, 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 cooperative effort with uh, ATF. Is that, are you aware of that? You know, I, I, I'm, I 
don't have sufficient knowledge to know why th that happened. I'm not going to speculate as to what ha what occurred to have our federal law enforcement partners uh, pull out on that. I do know that there were concerns expressed uh, about uh, data deconfliction and uh, certain um, investigative concerns, but uh, I'm not in a position to explain anything. Well, it sounds like the whole thing went haywire. Uh, and again, I'd like to see for the record how much it cost, what the results were for the whole period of time. Yield back. Gentleman yields back. We now go to the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Jones, thank you for being here today, for giving us your perspective as uh, the, now the director, formerly the acting director, former U.S. attorney and prosecutor as well. I think that's helpful for us on that. I understand that in many of these cases it was local law enforcement that asked the Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms Agency to set up these uh, undercover storefront operations in their communities. Is that correct? My understanding is that in all of those operations that there was, to varying degrees, local law, enfor local law enforcement involvement. Well, for example, in Milwaukee, uh, both uh, federal and local law enforcement requested uh, the agency's assistance. They wanted to target violent crime uh, and gang crime, and that's what led them to set up that particular store. Is that correct? Yes, sir. You know, I think everybody knows that gun violence is sort of a daily challenge uh, in many of our communities on that. Can you tell us why a local law enforcement agency would make that kind of request? Uh, oftentimes it's a resource issue. Sometimes it is uh, um, the collaborative nature of ATF's relationship with state and local law enforcement. We have excellent relations with state and locals across the country, and we partner with them on much of the work we do. In, um, uh, in cities large and small, and uh, that partnership is is very important to us. In your experience, how severe can the uh, the gun problem be in a local community before ATF is requested for its assistance? Uh, you, you know that that varies. Over the last couple of years, we've tried to be more focused in our, our resources by uh, uh, dedicating resources to those places that are experiencing. Uh, either in the short or long term, uh, higher levels of gun violence. Uh, but I think that, uh, again, that partnership that we have with uh, local law enforcement is uh, critical to us being successful. Now, in the wake of all the horrific gun violence uh, that we've experienced in this country, the President uh, developed a series of proposals that were aimed at uh, reducing gun violence without infringing on the rights of lawful uh, gun owners. Uh, they would have uh, purportedly provided law enforcement additional tools to prevent and prosecute gun crimes. Last year, a bipartisan group of Congress, 100 Democrat and Republican members, led by Representative Meehan, Representative Maloney, Representative Riggle, and, and Ranking Member Cummings, introduced the Gun Trafficking Prevention Act of 2013. Now, that is a bill that would have uh, made firearms trafficking a Federal crime for the first time and impose stronger penalties for straw purchases. Can you explain to us what straw purchases are? Straw purchasing essentially is um, making a misrepresentation on Form 4473 when you purchase a firearm legally that you are purchasing it for yourself. Yeah, when, in fact, you might be purchasing it for a convicted felon or somebody else who is prohibited from owning a gun. Yes, sir. Okay. So that bill would have, would have made those penalties and uh, made them stronger on that. It was supported by law enforcement right around the country. Uh, it was based on previous testimony from ATF agents that came before Congress and told us how helpful it would be to finally create a Federal offense for firearms trafficking. Do you believe that would have been one useful tool uh, in, our, in trying to get at gun violence? As a former prosecutor and as now the director of the law enforcement agency responsible for enforcing the Gun Control Act, having a more fulsome Federal firearms trafficking statute would be very helpful in uh, constructing cases and doing investigations. Can you talk a little bit about how the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms mission uh, could be better accomplished uh, by the adoption or strengthening of, of laws uh, that, that would help reduce gun violence? Are there other ways that we could uh, be of assistance? Well, I think it, uh, you know, I don't want to step out of my lane because, of course, Congress makes a law. We enforce the law. There's lots of input into it. I can give you the perspective of a former prosecutor and someone now who works with ATF that there are things that could be different. But I, you know, I, at the same time, I, I don't want to um, get into advocacy mode that's inappropriate. 
Uh, no, I, I respect that, and I don't want to put you on a position on that. But let me just close by saying we have that Gun Trafficking Prevention Act of 2013. It is a bipartisan proposal. It has been uh, supported by law enforcement organizations across the country, and perhaps one of our future um, hearings here, uh, rather than uh, be delving into conspiracy theories, could actually be talking about why that legislation has been brought forward and passed. With that, I yield back my time. I thank the gentleman for yielding back. We now go to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Fahrenthal. Thank you, Chairman Issa. Uh, Director Jones, thank you for being here. I, I know that's an uncomfortable seat sometimes for uh, folks. It's warm. <laughs> <laughs> we may rename it the hot seat. Um, I'm, I'm kind of want to get a step back and get a big picture uh, idea here. Can, can you re refresh my memory? What was the stated goal of your storefront operations? Well, it is a uh, business calculated to identify and proactively intervene with criminals and criminal activity in high crime areas. All right. So, and you you're, you're open up these storefronts and uh, you, you attempt to uh, buy guns back uh, from criminals. Is that one of the that that's a piece of it. It's its primary value is intelligence gathering. Oftentimes, the storefronts are wired for video and audio. People make admissions. Uh, people uh, we can identify them. We can run crim histories to see if they're prohibited on some occasions. So it's it, it it attracts. It's designed to attract a certain criminal element so that we can gather intelligence as to what's happening outside of the storefront. And I, I, the normal goal of law enforcement uh, is to move up the chain. You know, rather than getting the petty street criminal, you want to move up uh, up the chain to more serious offenses. That's norm, a normal operation for law enforcement, isn't it? Sometimes that that, that is to build. If you if you're interested in sort of uh, enterprise theory investigation to take out a whole gang, but sometimes you're talking about a single trigger puller who's got a reputation in a community of just being a bad actor. All right. Well, the reason I'm getting at this is, you know, we, ha we heard testimony uh, in, in this committee about Operation uh, Fast and Furious that really what they were after was taking down a, uh, a, a, drug, a drug lord in, in Mexico or or abroad. And what concerns me is, are we developing a, a mentality in here of uh, we're, we're, after the, uh, we're after the more serious offenses, damn the consequences. You know, we saw in Fast and Furious we let guns, uh, guns walk across the border with tragic results. Uh, we're seeing in this the uh, ATF in, encouraging people uh, to, you know, saw off a shotgun or ha having to train someone in what uh, an automatic weapon is. Shouldn't we, uh, shouldn't we be focused on just uh, getting the job done? And when we start uh, going beyond that, it's like we get in trouble. Well, I, I think it's important that storefront operations, the ones we're talking about, and, and the many others that are highly successful are just a tool in a toolbox that we have. They're not the end all to be all. There are other undercover operations. And, and you know, I, I, you know, I, I remain concerned that, again, if we, it's the Rudy Giuliani theory. We fix the broken windows, the big stuff starts to take care of itself. But, I mean, are we going for big headlines and big busts that may go forward with a political agenda? Uh, or, you know, can we just get down to the nitty gritty? But, but let me, in a speech you said, uh, uh, it was time for the ATF to bring our A-game, to protect the American people and public from a violent crime. And on my watch, that's what we're going to do. Uh, was Operation Fearless uh, your A-game? No, it wasn't the A-game. And we could do better. And I freely admit that. And we've learned lessons from Fearless. Uh, one of the reasons that we dispatched internal affairs is to peel back the onion, see what went wrong, validate some of the things that worked, and know what didn't work. Uh, you know, I think it's uh, significant to note that we put we hit the pause button on storefronts um, until we can get them right. Now, if we can't do them right, we don't do them. If we can't do them right, we don't do them. If they're not cited right, if they're not resourced right, if they're not staffed right, if there isn't an intelligence purpose for it other than to generate numbers, we're not doing them. All right, and and and, and let me ask: as 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 we go forward, we've been having trouble, obviously, from. Uh from the uh, Attorney General uh, in getting fast and furious information. Uh, and I, I just want to say, uh, are you willing to work hard with this committee to, uh, 
to make sure we get to the bottom of these things and, and they don't happen again. You know, I have read the, F, the Fast and Furious OIG report several times, uh, including in the last couple of weeks, and I, I fully understand some of the systemic issues. That is my challenge. There is ongoing litigation uh, with respect we to do, We just can't let this happen again. I have one other quick question that uh, a constituent wanted me to ask you. and uh, We are getting reports of trouble with imports of uh, seven in six Russian surplus ammunition, uh, yet we are not seeing anything from uh, your agency about this. Are you all planning on implementing a new policy on that? Well, I know it is kind of in left field, but. Yeah, it is kind of left field. Brownsville is wonderful, by right. the way, but uh, uh, we will we'll look into that. I did, if you can give us more context. All right, we will we'll, we'll get with you. I am out of time, so uh, I will yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I am not smart. The gentlelady from Illinois. Ms. Kelly. Thank you, Director Jones. As we assess the problems in Milwaukee, I would like to know how this investigative technique has been used in other cities to target violent crime. You stated in your testimony that since 2009, ATF has conducted 37 under undercover storefronts. Did the use of undercover storefronts only begin in 2009? No, it is. Uh it is an investigative technique that really has its genesis going back as far as 20 years in South Florida um, during the, you know, the, the height of the trafficking in Florida. And it is something that uh, we have very good people to do it. They are not always in the right place to do it and make sure it is done right. But we have had very successful storefronts around the country. So this technique has been used under other administrations like the Bush administration? I think the administration and the politics has less to do with it than sort of the public safety value of using this as an undercover technique, and it has been a, a, used for a, a long time. So um, how do you measure the success of these operations? I think one measurement of success really is uh, the people that end up coming into court. Uh, there were some successful operations in other parts of the country that did identify and end up in the conviction for very long mm -hmm. sentences of armed career criminals, people who have extensive records. There have been instances where storefronts have brought in people who are on the cusp of committing egregious acts of violence. I think at the intelligence value and the way that people have been brought in, the trigger pullers and the traffickers of crime guns getting pulled into this and giving us an opportunity to build a case around that person, eventually indicting them and hopefully sending them to prison. It is my understanding that the Pensacola police chief made a very strong statement about the outcome of uh, an operation you did there in 2011, and I will quote, the value of this operation is immeasurable and we may never know how many lives this may have saved. Do you agree with the police chief that the undercover operation uh, might have saved lives? Yeah, I, I do agree with the police chief in terms of, you know, it is very difficult to talk about the what if mm -hmm. circumstance, but we do know that there were uh, good, good work done at a very fundamental level and that um, trigger pullers and traffickers were pulled off the street and into the criminal justice system. And we have already talked about some of the other places that storefront operations occurred. Um, are you satisfied with the results in Albuquerque, Atlanta, some of the places we talked about, Portland, Wichita? Well, to the extent that, uh, you know, again, I have deeper knowledge about some rather than others, but, uh, you know, I, I, I do know that all of these operations resulted in uh, criminals going to jail in the end and making the community safer. Okay. Uh, also, uh, we talked a lot about the storefronts, but what other uh, tools are in the toolbox uh, to get illegal firearms off the streets and out of the hands of violent criminals? Well, one of the things that we are doing, particularly in Chicago, is experimenting, uh, maybe that we, we are developing firearms trafficking techniques to see the flow in the black market of firearms. Now, the crime gun pool is very deep and it is quite a challenge, but uh, you know, doing things from the trafficking, the following the gun, identifying um, FFLs uh, who may be supplying crime guns, identifying individual traffickers in the black market who may be supplying crime guns. And uh, we have worked real hard with folks 
in the Northern District of Illinois and in the Northern District of Indiana and studying the firearms trafficking patterns and trying to intervene to cut off to the extent that we can the supply and also make sure that those who are engaged in unlicensed dealing, uh, people who are selling guns on the black market, get our full attention so that we can at least drain a little bit out of the crime gun pool. Well, representing that area, I'm very glad to hear that. When I was a state legislator, that was the first bill I passed uh, dealing with store purchases, so I know how very important that is. Thank you so much. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. We can now go to We now go to the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Meadows. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Jones, uh, I wanted to go ahead and follow up. In your testimony just a few minutes ago, you mentioned that I know that we're highlighting these six different storefront operations in your testimony today, but I think to quote you, you said, quote, the other highly successful storefront operations. What are the other highly successful storefront operations? Well, the one that immediately comes to mind is um, an operation, uh, and I don't want to overstep because some of these are still in, in the mode, but does... Uh, well, you, according to your testimony, there's no active storefronts right now, so I don't know that we would be putting any anybody in jeopardy. No, but once they close down and it goes into prosecution mode, they're still... All right. Well, go, go ahead. What, what are the other highly successful? Well, I, you know, the one that immediately comes to mind, uh, because I just saw a recommendation uh, for an award as Smoking Guns 2, which is in Miami Gardens in the Southern District of Florida, right. that was very successful in taking out... So what's successful? How do you define success? Identifying a very... Uh, deadly armed criminal group that was engaged both in okay. firearms trafficking and drug trafficking in South Florida. All right. Do you have storefront operations in Chicago? We don't have any current storefront okay. operations. Do you have, well, have you had them in Chicago? Off, uh, as I sit here today, I can't definitively say right. we've never done I, I don't think you have, yeah. but uh, how about in Los Angeles? Have you had, in the city of Los Angeles, have you had storefront operations? Again, I, I can't off the top of my head say that we've never had or not had a storefront in Los Angeles. So did you prepare for coming to provide testimony today? <laughs> yes, I did. Uh, and wouldn't you assume that some of that out of the 37 storefront operations that you would be able to figure out which ones you, you've actually had or haven't had? Well, my focus was on the ones where... Uh, I know your focus was, <laughs> but I'm saying in your testimony, it talked about 37, so you say today that you can't tell me whether you had one in Los Angeles, Chicago, or New York. Have you had any storefront operations in any of those three cities? Without certainty right here now, I can't say... What is your best guess? <laughs> I don't like to guess when I'm sitting here under oath. <laughs> well, you've got staffers behind you. Do, do they know if you've had any storefront operations in any of those three cities? I don't believe you have, but have you had any? We will find out. Okay. So under what matrix do you decide where to put storefront operations? Primarily by the intelligence needs and the commitment of locals to work with us. It is a tool So you're saying specific. those three cities, you might not have had the commitment of locals to work with you? It is a technique that we use uh, on occasion, but it's not the only technique that we use. Okay, the, the, reason, larger, the reason why I ask, let me, let me tell you the reason why I ask. Those three, according, according to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, according to their, uh, their report, are the top three cities in terms of gun-related violence, and yet you don't seem to have storefront operations in the very top three in our nation in terms of gun-related violence. The President even talks about Chicago, and yet you don't have operations there. Why, why would that be? Because we're using other types of investigative techniques in those major metropolitan areas where the dynamics on the ground and uh, the opportunities to identify bad guys uh, are a lot different than smaller venues. That's exactly what I thought you would say. So there is not a direct correlation between storefront operations and gun-related violence, is what you're saying. 
depending on the venue that you open up, if you pick the right spot, yes. Okay, so there's not a direct, those are the top three. You have no storefront operations, so there's not a direct correlation in terms of selling out of a storefront versus the number of deaths that happen according to gun-related violence. There's no empirical evidence that would suggest that. It is a technique that is... I, I, I understand the technique. Is there any empirical evidence to that effect? Because you're, where you're placing these would suggest that there is not. We've placed them all around the country. And, and again... Why did you not place them in the top three gun-related, violent, murder capitals of, of our country? Why would you not place them there then? If there was a direct correlation, why would you not place them there? Well, you know, one of the things that immediately comes to mind is in those larger urban areas, you've got uh, very difficult deconfliction issues going on because a lot of people are playing in the same territory. And so there's, there's safety risk involved with uh, this type of undercover technique, both in terms of maintaining its integrity, sharing information. That's one of the things so that it's, happened. So it's easier, to, let me, I'll, I'll, if the chairman will indulge this last question. Briefly. It, it's easier for an ATF agent to blend in in Wichita, Kansas, than it is in New York City. <laughs> that's a, the, 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 the gentleman I'll answer back. if he can. I, you know, that's, I, I can't answer that. I mean, you know, on some of these storefronts, we bring in undercovers from different parts of the country. One of the reasons that we don't often have local law enforcement in an undercover capacity in a place like Milwaukee where they weren't behind the counter is because they work in Milwaukee and they may run into somebody that they've arrested. And so maintaining the integrity of the undercover operation does sometimes require bringing in people from out of town because they're not known. Thank you. Uh, at this time, we go to the gentlelady from California, Ms. Spear. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And, and thank you, uh, Director Jones. I, I think what this hearing has helped me solidify is the importance of us having another hearing to talk about storefronts in general, Mr. Chairman. Um, I don't know about you, but I want to know how much money we're spending on this kind of activity. And Mr. Jones, maybe you can tell us, how much do you budget for storefronts a year? Well, we don't budget for storefronts. We budget for operations. I think in looking at um, some of the basic information on this, the, you know, there, there's a cost of the site. There's, of course... Okay. I, what we need to do is find out how much you do spend. You've had 37 of these storefronts. Um, I think uh, I certainly would like, and probably the chair would like as well, um, documentation to tell us how much was spent on each storefront and what uh, was recovered as a result. I was with our U.S. attorney this morning who said that you actually had a very successful one in Gilroy, California called Operation Garlic Press. Where you come up with these clever names? Someone sits around well, well, with a great sense well, of Well, come on. Gilroy and garlic, that's not all that clever. Well, I mean, but it's, it, it is, in fact, taking advantage of the fact that it is the garlic capital of the world. But in, <laughs> any, in any case, uh, she indicated to me that there were some 92 persons that were um, charged or were at least uh, found to be uh, gun running. Um, so I think we need to have a better sense of and a better accountability of how much money is being spent on each of these operations and to the point of one of my colleagues, um, why certain areas are picked and others are not. Um, now, uh, I'm would also... The, would the gentlelady suspend for just a moment? I certainly will give me extra time. <laughs> uh, if you'll hold it. Uh, Director Jones, there's been a series of questions on a bipartisan basis and maybe to cut short the need for those questions. Would you agree to prepare a briefing, a secure briefing, for the committee that would include, those, include essentially what Ms. Spear is talking about, but expanding on cost, all of the operations, and then obviously because the earlier briefing we had alleged that there was only one in Milwaukee that was flawed, and now we, of course, have similar situations in others, a more expansive ability to answer questions on 
the good, the bad, and the ugly, if you will, of these various operations around the country. Is that something you could give us a timeline and commit to that we would make the committee I, I think, available? I think, Mr. Chair, I think it would be of value to educate because I think these storefronts in particular that we're talking about are the ones that there were issues with, but as uh, the Congresswoman, as Ms. Spears talks about, there have been successful storefronts. They, they, they are a valid technique, and I think it would be of value. And, and we can work with staff to get that in the appropriate venue because, again, we always have law enforcement sensitive. We've got uh, techniques that, uh, in a public setting, may, you know, we don't and I, and I inadvertently educate bad guys. Right. And I would appreciate it. I mean, this, today's hearing, Ms. Spear and I are both aware, is on some flaws that have been that you are working on today to correct. But I think it would be helpful. So I would make uh, one of our large, would probably bring this room into a, uh, a secure mode uh, at a time uh, to be arranged. If your folks before the end of the hearing could give us an estimate, we will make, make that time available in a few weeks. Uh, Ms. Spear, thank you for bringing it to it was time to ask the question, and the gentlelady's time fully continues. Thank you. Um, I also want to um, alert you to a program called Operation Lipstick, which started in Boston. Um, it's a program focused on women, and since uh, more than 50 percent of gun trafficking cases involve straw purchases, and guns purchased by women are two times as likely to be used to commit a crime, uh, they are working in the communities to try and get uh, the word out to women who tend to be the girlfriends or the wives who go in and buy the guns, that they become accomplices of crime as well. And I think it is one of the kinds of activities that we should be looking at as well. Um, I also want to point out that you have the ability to recommend to the President that he no longer allow for the importation of uh, Russian bullets or assault weapons. Uh, George H. W. Bush, President, had done that by executive order. Uh, it was enhanced by then President Clinton. It then expired under President George W. Bush. And so the importation of these guns and bullets continues. We have a case in California where a state senator was um, willing to, uh, for a campaign donation, provide a, an FBI undercover agent with guns and um, shoulder missiles from the Philippines. So we have some other areas that we can be looking at, and I hope that you will um, take that into account. Now, in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, they referenced and suggested that the ATF storefront operation was actually generating crime. And I would like for you to respond to that allegation. Well, that is a concern when we design uh, a storefront operation, and we need to have indicators, for example, from the local police department as to whether or not there has been a spike in burglaries, for example. We know that there were issues with respect to folks who um, purchased weapons and then resold them. That is always a phenomena that, that you have to maintain a certain um, level of risk to make sure that that is not happening. Well, let me ask you this. Were they actually selling or, or, or purchasing guns for sky-high prices? I think uh, from what I have seen that the prices uh, were comparable to the black market price. The price that we pay in these operations for a gun really is not sort of what is it listed uh, at, at uh, lawful FFL for. It is it, the, the black market gun. These are, these are crime guns, so there is value on them. If it has got an obliterated serial number, for example, it has got great value. If it's okay. For clarification purposes, were any of these firearms that were purchased then sold at those storefronts? No, we, did, we do not. I think that is very important. We do not understand. sell. at It is it's one way. You, we buy the weapons. We do not sell the weapons. All right. Thank you. My time's expired. I thank the gentlelady. Go, sir. We now go to the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Ventivoglio. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Cummings, and distinguished members of the committee. You know, as uh, as we all know, one aw shucks can wipe out a thousand attaboys, and we know there's um, uh, my experience working with AT and F uh, over the years. History, um, always professional, uh, brave, valiant. 
But after reading this testimony, I cannot even get my head around what has happened in this case. Uh, when I was preparing for this hearing yesterday, I actually thought my staff was playing an April Fool's joke on me. The operation could have not have been this botched. This investigation could not have been this mishandled. I am not sure where to even begin. But I do know this. I have a frame of mind right now after reading and hearing this testimony. I would join any member of Congress who sponsors a bill to keep hand, or guns out of the hands of ATF agents. And with that in mind, I have just a sh few questions. Um, ATF agents recruited mentally handicapped people or people with an IQ in their 50s to assist with this operation. Later, these individuals were arrested for their involvement. I taught special education when I was a teacher and was surrounded by these kids. They are some of the best, most caring, nicest people who try their best and try and want to please. I am appalled that you would use these indiv individuals like this and then arrest them later. Does ATF even regret using these individuals in this way? Hindsight's 2020, Congressman, and I think that uh, you know, there's lessons to be learned. And as I mentioned earlier, there's opportunities for us to do better in terms of uh, situational awareness training and making sure that uh, um, we do it right. We, um, you know, in my experience, uh, it's, there's, there's a difference um, in individuals with low IQ. It's pretty easy to spot. You would think anybody with any life experience can just ask a simple question. Is this the person we should be using for this operation? Um, so you, you're going to discontinue using individuals in this way that have this low IQ? To, to the extent that we, can, we know that up front at that stage okay. in it's, an investigation, uh, of course. It's the, of course. Okay. Has ATF apologized to any of these individuals? Well, I know that the, the person in particular who had uh, uh, from the, the Portland operation, we've had some interaction with them, but you know, many of the individuals, unfortunately, are uh, in the custody of the Bureau of Prisons, and so, you know, the uh, the opportunity for interaction is limited. Okay, in the storefront location in New Mexico, ATF agents gave lessons on how to identify a machine gun. In the location in Kansas, ATF agents told a man how to saw off the end of a shotgun. It is normal. For, is it normal for ATF agents to teach heroin addicts and drug dealers? How to tell the difference between a machine gun and a semi-automatic weapon? Well, I think it's I, I, you know I think it's important to note that when these ATF agents are in an undercover capacity, they have to go into role, and so uh, unless you want to blow the integrity of the operation, and again, you got to make decisions about the cost-benefit analysis. But uh, talking about your decisions, um, I heard earlier you mentioned that before you go into any operation. You uh, do a risk analysis. Did I hear that correctly? You, you evaluate the risk. That's current state, yes, sir. Okay. So why wasn't uh, one of the risk of, um, well, let's see if I can answer this or ask this question um, in a different way. Was one of those highly successful operations in a storefront, the one that was located within 1,000 feet of a middle school? And if that's the case, why wasn't a risk analysis done for that? Why would you put one of these storefront operations where you have criminals coming in with these guns and rifles uh, a thousand, within 1,000 feet of a middle school? I think the case you're, if, I, if I'm correct in my recollection, I think the case you're discussing is the, the Portland operation, and, and it was cited poorly in terms of its proximity to a school. Uh, current state is. Uh, making sure that the location is not only secure, but you avoid situations like that. But that, that's, a, that's, this is, that's an after the fact. The Portland so you, operation was... So you have an ongoing... Uh, three years ago. Okay. After action review, what went right, what went wrong, and how can we do better tomorrow, right? Yes. That's... The, that's and you have a, a policy in place that's going to apply those things that you've learned for future operations? Yes, sir. Okay, so we still have already a, in place. It seems like you are um, once again learning the lessons of how not to do an operation on a regular basis. Thank you. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Clay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me thank you uh, also for conducting this hearing um, to uh, to allow um, me to publicly thank 
um, Director Jones and the men and women of ATF uh, for putting their lives on the line on a daily basis uh, to, to protect communities throughout this country. And one example that I would like to share with my colleagues uh, is the storefront operation conducted in my hometown, St. Louis, Missouri. The St. Louis and East St. Louis metropolitan areas consistently rank in the top five most dangerous cities uh, in overall violent crime. Uh, Director Jones, in your testimony, you highlight that in April through July in 2013, ATF led a 15-week surge, including a storefront operation to reduce violent crime in my district. According to several news outlets and other accounts, uh, this surge was successful. Let me repeat for my colleagues, this surge was successful. The storefront operation was successful, resulting in 159 defendants being charged, of which 78 percent were previously convicted felons. In addition, 267 firearms and significant quantities of illegal narcotics were taken into ATF custody. This enforcement action had a significant impact on violent crime as an analysis uh, by the St. Louis City Police Department comparing crime statistics from January through July 2012 to statistics for the same time frame in 2013, revealed that murder was down 15.7 percent. Robbery was down 22.3 percent, and aggravated assault was down 22.6 percent. Uh, Mr. Director, my first question is, in, in enforcement actions like this one in St. Louis, how much of a priority does ATF place on working cooperatively with local law enforcement to address public safety and law, and how important is it to reducing violent crime? I think it is absolutely critical, Congressman. That opportunity that we had uh, last year to work um, an enhanced enforcement operation in St. Louis was um, probably one of the better operations we have done during my tenure because we brought the full package. We brought in experts who know how to do a storefront. We brought in experts that did undercover. We were working very closely, not only with the St. Louis Police Department, but also the East St. Louis Police Department. I think it is an example of the pivot that we have made on uh, two things, having a focus, uh, a unified effort with our state and locals, and getting the resources that we need to the spot. And unfortunately, what we did in St. Louis cannot be replicated all around the country, and it is one of the things that we have moved to with the mobility model. Um, so that we can bring assets from around the country to do it and do it right, or we are not going to do it at all. And that is particularly important when we do undercover operations. And, and, and that is why I take this opportunity to say thank you to you and the men and women of the ATF, speaking on behalf of my constituents uh, who want to live in a safer environment, who want their neighborhoods cleaned, who want those illegal weapons taken off the streets. Tell me, what is the impact of violent crime on the youth and people of color in a city like St. Louis, and what success is ATF having uh, in, disrupt in disrupting and dismantling gang violence in areas that you target? You know, unfortunately, there are pockets of, uh, of violent gun crime that increasingly are involving um, younger individuals. Um, and it is, I call it more disorganized crime. It is it's blocks, it is turfs, it is sort of, it is ingrained. Uh, the challenges in St. Louis or, or in Memphis or in Chicago, there are areas around the country that uh, we are working very closely to do two things, identify traffickers so that we can disrupt the crime gun pool 
and to identify the worst of the worst in terms of the trigger pullers who are often not only teaching downstream uh, a culture of violence, but also perpetrating violence themselves. And so the armed career criminals that are in these communities are um, of particular interest to us. Thank Traffickers you. and trigger pullers. Thank you so much. And Mr. Chairman, we should be supporting these efforts and not trying to conduct witch hunts on the uh, I am sure the gentleman knows we are not, but uh, would the gentleman yield to the ranking member? Oh, certainly. Thank you very much. Mr. Clayton, I am glad you mentioned that. And, um, but I want to go back to what the chairman has said a little bit earlier, um, Director, with regard to the briefing that you all are going to give us. I think that in light of what Mr. Clay just said, I think it is extremely important that we hear about the good, some of this good stuff that is happening, um, because I can tell you, living where I live, um, it is, I mean, people feel like they are, sometimes they are in a, in a terror zone, uh, I mean, and it is hard. And trying to get to the very people that Mr. Clay talked about is so very, very important. And if the ATF has a way of the way you are doing it right, right, and I am glad you said what you said, do it right or not at all, it, 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 is, it sounds like the kind of tool that would be very, very helpful in the neighborhoods like the one I live in. Um, and I just, I am really looking forward to that, um, and I am looking forward to all the um, changes that you all have made to make sure that we get it right. And so I, I'm, uh, I hope that can be, I hope we will be able to have that briefing uh, very soon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. DeSantis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome, Director. I am over here. <laughs> um, you were sworn in uh, August 2013. Is that correct? Oh. Time flies. I think it was August. Roughly. Yeah. Um, and, and I just mentioned that because, um, you know, I'm going to ask about uh, some of the issues that my colleague from Ohio, Jim Jordan, asked about in terms of ATF's visit to this woman in Texas. And I just wanted to clarify, whatever happened during that, those instances uh, happened before you came on board. Um, and so, you know, at this point, what we're asking for you to do in terms of responding to Mr. Jordan's letter um, is just to be transparent about what happened. And if any, nothing uh, sinister happened, nothing sinister happened. But we're in a situation where um, uh, this woman applied for tax exempt status for two conservative leaning groups. Um, and she was, after having never had any interaction with law enforcement uh, for 20 years, she was visited by the IRS, OSHA, FBI, ATF, and Texas's version uh, of the EPA. And of course, this committee has been consumed with dealing with targeting done uh, by the Internal Revenue Service, um, and we've had high officials in the IRS who have, uh, who have refused to testify, and we've had trouble getting documents. And so I hope you'll be a force for transparency. Um, so here, here's what I understand. They had a, a license for 12 years. Um, uh, basically, it's a metal, precision metal cutting company. They did the firearm license thinking maybe we'll do firearm parts at some point. They never actually manufactured any firearm parts. Um, and so even though they'd had a license for a while, ATF audited them February 2012. So do you know the reason why that audit took place? You know, my understanding now, and I've had that opportunity to look at the timeline, is that uh, uh, Ms. Engelbrecht, uh, the business uh, was issued a Plan B firearms license by ATF in October of 2009. In February of 2012, um, we had a routine compliance inspection. There were some minor record keeping errors. Um, that there was a warning letter issued, and then in April of 2013, uh, we conducted a follow-up inspection, and there were no violations. So over a period of between 2009 and 13, um, you know, this as as simple as it sounds, coincidence is an explanation, irrespective of what other agencies were doing. Uh, no, I understand that. Now, how common is it that, given that they were not involved in firearms manufacturing at all, I understand they had the license thinking they may do it, 
um, you know, devoting the resources to auditing them versus um, using resources in other areas. I mean, I'd imagine you guys have limited resources. You know that you can't possibly deal with every issue out there. So what went into, or do you know what went into the decision, you know, to focus those two visits on Engelbrecht Enterprises rather than, given that they weren't even manufacturing any firearm parts, vis-a-vis -vis doing that um, in other areas that may have been more pressing in terms of the threat that they pose to the public? Well, I think that there are two things to keep in mind that uh, the inspection, the investigative function, the regulatory function, we got 700, 700 approximately investigators around the country, thousands of licensees, both FFLs and FELs, and that they do have a punch list and if you've read the IG report, you know that sometimes we have things fall behind simply right. because of the volume. Uh, you know, we have discretionary time where we can focus on uh, naughty FFLs, those few that are naughty, and then there's the non-discretionary time. And, and so there's a, there's a practice, a three-year, you know, a 2009 uh, FFL license issued after qualification inspection and then coming down for routine compliance inspection within 12 years. Um, I'm not sure which field division would cover that, but I know both the Dallas and the Houston field divisions have a pretty vibrant inspection schedule because of the number of licensees down there. So, I so would you? Um, I mean, you would you would state uh, uh, definitively that it would be inappropriate if her filing for tax exempt status for conservative leaning organizations influence ATF in any way. You would admit that that would be totally inappropriate if something like that were to happen. And that's, that, that's not part of our practice. We have our hands full trying to just do, keep up with the volume of inspections, both required qualifications, follow-up, compliance. Uh, people are working very hard on the inspections front, and uh, they're doing the best they can. And, and that, that's, that's not into the mix as to who ends up on the compliance inspection list. Uh, and I appreciate your time today. I would just uh, reiterate the chairman and Mr. Jordan, I mean, if you can just get us answers to that letter um, in noted. due time, Thank we you. really appreciate that. And um, I yield back. Thank you. I think the gentleman, we now go to the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Maloney. I thank the chairman and the ranking member for holding this hearing. And Director Jones, welcome. And I, I know that the nature of today's hearing is about ATF undercover storefront operations. Uh, but we've never had the director of the ATF before, and I, I would like to ask you some questions related to ATF hearings that we have held um, before in this uh, hearing, specifically on the problem of gun trafficking. In 2001, the House Oversight Committee, um, we had one of your special agents, uh, Peter Faselli, and uh, I asked him whether criminal penalties are so weak that federal prosecutors are discouraged from pursuing cases involving the so-called straw purchasers, those who buy guns and sell to known felons and others who should not, or legally cannot have them. He had testified in his written and really his oral statement that the current uh, straw purchasing laws, and I quote, are toothless. That's what he said. And he further said that that existing gun laws do not provide law enforcement officials the tools they need to successfully stop the flow of illegal guns to Mexico. He also testified that in his view, Operation Fast and Furious was a partial consequence of these uh, deficiencies. And it is an issue of great concern, I think, in the, in the country. I, 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 Jackie Spear mentioned uh, the lipstick cases that they're trying to inform women. But shortly after Sandy Hook in Webster, New York in 2012, like a week or two afterwards, there was a terrible case uh, where a prior felon was released. Uh, a straw purchaser got him a, a, a bunch of guns. He then put his house on fire. And when the police and the fire department came to put the fire out, he mowed him down, shot him. And certainly, if this woman had known there would be real penalties, I doubt she would have been out there buying guns for him. And uh, they testified, these agents in that hearing, that, uh, that they don't even bother to prosecute or even refer him to prosecution because the penalties are so weak 
that you're not even doing anything. It's almost not worth the time of law enforcement. So in response to that, I authored a bill that made trafficking in guns a felony. I find it almost unbelievable that trafficking in illegal guns is not a felony. And, and increasing the penalties on straw purchasing, I, a, a, an incredible amount of law enforcement came out across the country in support of this legislation. It's bipartisan. Uh, an NRA member, Scott Rigel, is one of the prime uh, leaders on this, as well as uh, Ranking Member Cummings, and also a former prosecutor, I think, from Pennsylvania, Representative Meehan, uh, has been very active on it. And uh, it seems to me this is, if we don't give the tools to law enforcement to do their job, uh, the testimony from these agents was, we don't even bother to prosecute because the penalties are so weak, uh, we don't, it's, it's not worth our time to pursue it. So I guess my, my question is, do you think that, uh, uh, that we should have stronger laws and penalties against straw purchasers, and, and do you think it would stop the practice that has uh, really been such a terrible a problem in our country? According to a, a report from the ATF in 2000, and I quote, straw purchasing is the most common channel of illegal gun trafficking, accounting for almost half, 46 percent of all investigations. Uh, this is from your own division. And do you think stronger penalties would help uh, bring down that number? And if you could comment on it, uh, I, I think it's a very important issue. And, and it's certainly keeping guns out of criminals' hands should be a top priority. Um, law enforcement, uh, law-abiding law people can own guns. It's not a aimed at them. It's for criminals, drug dealers, gang dealers. And uh, your comments on and experiences? Uh, it, it, Congresswoman, I think that is uh, one of our focuses in our overall mission. And, um, you know, as I mentioned before, if a, a federal firearms trafficking statute would be helpful. I know that uh, there are increasing efforts across the country by U.S. attorneys who we work closely with to do uh, more straw purchasing or providing a gun to a prohibited person. Um, I know that the sentencing U.S. Sentencing Commission has revised recently their guidelines, but uh, to get back to your point, um, a federal firearms trafficking statute would be helpful. I, I, I would uh, push back a little bit about these cases aren't being done. I think that they are being done by U.S. attorneys around the country. Uh, the challenge is more getting, um, getting the fact pattern and making sure that you're not getting an unwitting, well, the, well, the lipstick phenomena, um, the Operation Lipstick phenomena. I mean, it's, it's, you know, a criminal defendant who's got no crim history, who may be in a relationship with a bad guy and ends up in federal court for the first time is different than somebody who's got sort of a pattern of purchasing weapons and doing sort of the aggregation and then selling them on the black market. The, the testimony of your agents was that it was a slap on the hand or a paper, paper notice. And, and possibly we should do a joint GAO request to find out how our straw purchasers treated when they are convicted. That, that was the point that they made. They don't even fo follow through or try to convict because the penalties are so weak. And so the bill that we worked on increases penalties. I believe it's uh, supported by your department and many other law enforcement. And I, I think it's worth looking at. And uh, I think a GAO report on what does happen to traffickers. I, now, I, th I, th I, th I thank the gentlelady, but gentlelady's time, has, as okay. my predecessor said, has long experienced.